You're listening to audio recorded at Mount Air First Christian Church. For more resources or to contact us, look us up at www.mountairfirstchristianchurch.org. Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 24 through 29. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone And teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. Well, what does our faith really have to offer people? When we look around at the world and there's just scores of remedies, there's tons of answers for various ailments. You can go to the bookstore, to the self-help section, which which by that I mean you can go to Amazon.com and browse the self-help section. No one goes to bookstores anymore. But uh, you used to do that. And, And there's all sorts of remedies for all sorts of problems. Well, when it comes to that list of self-help or whatever, how... How does Christianity compete with those kind of tactics? I've got a friend of mine that we meet every week and we like to read through leadership books and mainly just to kind of make fun of them. Like they're, because they all say basically the same thing. Like no matter what, there's like a few big works like uh, uh, Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and then like the new one is The Atomic Habits by James Clear and you're all like, what are you, uh, glassed over at this point. But they, they all take those topics basically and just kind of regurgitate them and give new illustrations. They all say basically the same things. But the, it's, it's funny how they take all those different ideas, repackage them, and just try to give you better tactics to, for life, better tactics to lead, or better tactics to handle whatever issue. Is that all Christianity is? And in that marketplace of ideas, is that what Christianity is trying to be? Here is a, another example of tactics Here's another example of principles to live your life by. Here's another uh, just set of standards to to work at to improve your life. If you were to look around our world today, you might be convinced that that's the truthfulness of, of of the mentality of Christianity. But that is not at all what Christianity is about. This morning, this text, it's... It's a preacher's life text. Like, I come to this and I want to, like, I start thinking, can I go to Podium Inc. and get them to print a giant poster that just says, Him we proclaim. This this becomes just the heartbeat of of a pastor, of a preacher. I preached through Colossians uh, about 10 years ago. And no, I'm not just taking those old notes. And I haven't even, I don't even know where they are. So don't, don't accuse me of just taking, taking it easy, phoning it in. This is, I didn't do that. But I remember coming to this text and just being blown away by the ramifications of the Christian message is boiled down to this. Him we proclaim. We talk about Jesus if you ever wonder why Jesus is so central, and I, I hope that it comes across to you sometimes like this. I guess I take it for granted that you think this about what we do here on a Sunday morning. But we talk about Jesus so much. 
(laughs) Every Sunday, we're talking not about your greatness, not about all the great things you can do, not about all these whatever ideas. We talk about Jesus and his greatness. Well, Colossians 1.28 is why. We have one message. It is him that we proclaim. He is the message. He is the one that we talk about. There's quite a few things actually going on in this verse. And an important part to realize is is where Paul ends this sentence. You see 28, him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom to what end? That we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this, that, that, the word that is a purpose statement there. That we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. His desire is to present everyone mature, having come to fruition. I, I love the sound of that phrase, to present everyone fully mature in Christ. Who doesn't want to be grown up in Christ? Who doesn't want to be mature Who doesn't want to be mature in Christ? I really and truly am interested in knowing how do we get to that? (laughs) Paul's desire is that through warning everyone and teaching everyone, he'd be able to present everyone mature in Christ. I would love to just be solid in my faith, to not waver, to when fears rise up, they, they, con- they, they come against my trust in God's promises. I would love to just not waver. I would love to be so grounded in Christ that I am not moved. I desire this reality of being mature in Christ, presented mature in Christ. But the question is, how do we get there? Paul's desire is to present everyone mature in Christ. Great. But now how do we get there? And this is where the, the, the claim of this passage is so astonishing. Because when you think about how you get to maturity, I mean, just thinking about maturing through um, high school. And so you get to a place of maturity when you graduate high school. But what you have learned as a senior is obviously different than what you learned at kindergarten. So there is this clear progression of you begin to learn new things, take different classes, and you reach this element of maturity. But where Paul leads to this, what he's saying, his argument is that what leads to this maturity in Christ is the proclamation of Jesus. It is the shocking simplicity and yet the complexity, which we'll get to, of the statement that it is Christ and the proclamation of who he is and that alone that brings a person to maturity in Christ. We often think, I mean, you know, what's next? This is, the, this is one of the problems he's encountering at the church at Colossae. Okay, you know, I've got Jesus down. Okay, okay. he died on the cross for my sins. Uh, repent, try to stop sinning, trust him. What's next? Where do we go next? What's, I want next tier Christianity. Where do I go next? Okay, I've got the Jesus thing down, but, but now what? Where do I go on to? And Paul kind of bursts that bubble and he says, here's where we go, here's where we go on to. We go back to Jesus again and again and again. Him we proclaim. The false teachers, which we'll get into here just in a little bit uh, in the chapter two, not today, but in a few weeks, we'll get to the false teachers trying to have, they have dreams and visions and all these incredible new revelation about how to move on in your Christianity. And Paul's saying, no, we proclaim Jesus Christ. The mystery hidden for ages and generations now revealed Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here's why that's a big deal. We don't promote principles of living. We don't invent new important practices to achieve what you do, what you want in life. We don't preach fulfilling your plan or living for your purpose. We don't participate in the promise of practical habits to turn your life around. We don't preach any of those things. We preach Christ. Him we proclaim. Our answer is not mere principles, practices, or performances. 
Our answer is a person. Our answer is a person. We don't gather to get tips on how to make life better, how to handle these situations, all the things you should line up in your life to make it go a certain way. We don't, this isn't about tricks and tips and principles and practices. This is about a person. His name is Jesus. Him we proclaim. Jesus Christ, God made man, the Son of God incarnate. He is the supreme Christ. He's so supreme, he's so huge, he's so big and authoritative over it all that like I said a few weeks ago, there isn't an area of your life that he does not have influence over. There's not an area of your life that Jesus does not look at and say, this is mine. He has claim over every area. So it seems like a simplistic Sunday school answer. I mean, every kid, like, you know, when you're going to, through Sunday school, teacher asks the question, what's always the right answer? Jesus. <laughs> right? Like, you're going to, like, because what Sunday school teacher is going to, what Sunday school teacher at that point is going to say, no, Jesus is not the answer. No one's going to say that. They're going to like, okay, yeah, yeah. Jesus is kind of the answer. I mean, they're going to find a way around it. But in a very real sense, that's so simple. But the answer What Paul is saying, not even Darren, what Paul is saying here in this text, the answer to it all is Jesus. That's why it is him that we proclaim. Now, while on one front, that is a very simplistic reality. It's very deep and radical in its implications. Paul says in this text that he is proclaiming Jesus, that proclaiming is warning everyone and teaching everyone. Still proclaiming Christ, but when you proclaim the person of Christ, it does come then with certain warnings. It does come with certain teachings. It's for the proclamation of Christ, but it does come with with these realities. Admonishing, rebuking, uh, other translations say instead of warning. Maybe admonishing, rebuking, it gets across the point of, you're teaching someone to correct, to correct a direction. Um, and, and just quickly, he, he's saying everyone. And I'm simple, I mean, but everyone there means he's saying to everyone. Every, he's admonishing, warning everyone. There is no certain class of person. There is no certain ethnicity that's outside of this admonition and encouragement and teaching. There is no gender that's outside of this admonishment and teaching. There is no individual who is outside the reach of this hymn that we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone. This gospel is for everyone. But those who hear of Christ will hear both the admonition of, his, of Christ and the calling to live a life of following Christ. That warning everyone in, in, the, in the Greek lexicon, Lunite lexicon, says is to advise someone concerning the dangerous consequences of some happening or action, to warn or warning. So here's a serious but, but difficult question. Does the Jesus you know ever rebuke you for your thinking or your behavior? Does the Jesus you know ever rebuke you for your thinking or for your actions, for anything you do, any thought? Does he ever rebuke you? Because if, if, if the Jesus that you know, you never hear an admonishment from, I'm going to warn you that Jesus may not be the real Jesus or else you're just a terrible listener, I suppose, is a possibility. But... The reality of all of us not reaching their state of glorification, being sinners, not perfect in our holiness and righteousness, means that if we know this Jesus, there are going to be many areas of our life where he's going to be pointing out, this is wrong. This is sinful. You need to change this attitude. You need to walk in forgiveness. You need to love this person. You need to walk with more grace. You need to be more kind. You need to stop this behavior. You need to change your thinking. Why do you hold animus and hatred towards this person? Jesus is going to be rebuking you. Not a single one of us has reached glorification and freedom from sin because 
this Christ, this one, if, if you are his, since he dwells in you, there are areas of your life, some small and likely some huge, that Jesus needs to work on and we want to let him. That is what this proclamation of Jesus is. It isn't like we just proclaim Jesus and then go on and, yeah, I've got Jesus. There, there is a warning that comes with the proclamation of Christ. And the way that those areas get worked on is through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, hearing the word of Christ, confessing uh, your, your sins as sin and in repentance, turning from them. But this will not happen if you do not hear the rebuke of the word of Christ. We're so sensitive in our world today that hearing a rebuke on the way we live our lives or the priorities that we embrace is just immediately, reflexively guarded against. Don't tell, me how to, don't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me it's what I want to do. Don't tell me how to live my life. Don't tell me what's wrong or what's right. My truth is my truth. You keep your truth, your truth. Don't, don't talk to me. Don't, don't have any admonition towards me. Well, that's, that is a fundamental disregarding of the Christian faith, which does come to you and say, you are a sinner who needs to turn from your sin. Thank God there is a Savior who died to take the punishment of your sin upon himself so that you could be forgiven. So there is this admonition, this warning and then there is this teaching. Not only do we turn away from that which displeases God, but we turn to that which does please God. We don't naturally want to do this. We just read Romans 8 that the one who is in the flesh is actually hostile to God. We don't want to obey God's law. Indeed, we cannot, Romans 8 says. So in our flesh, we do not, we, not only do we do the things we shouldn't do, we don't have any desire to do the things that we should do. But the teaching of Christ does come to us and says, this is how you ought to live. Turning the other cheek, loving your neighbor, and not only that, loving your enemy and praying for them. Forgiving the wrongs done to you, forgiving them. Not only turning from the things you shouldn't do, but turning towards the things that you should do. So... There's great simplicity. Jesus, he's the one that we proclaim. A person. Not principles, not practices, but a person. Very simple, but very complex in all the ways that that plays out. So how does that then actually play out? Well, many times, far harder, but infinitely more rewarding than any other way of living. And that's what I mean is, when you, if you were to come to me, if we were to go sit back in my office with this issue that's facing your life, you're going to know pretty much the answer I'm going to give you. Jesus needs to get involved here. <laughs> Jesus, Him we proclaim. I, I don't be surprised if you show up and, and Darren only has one Tom and it's got one no and he bangs. It's Jesus, Him we proclaim. Very simple answer. So if you come, we're, we're going to talk about Jesus, which is a very simplistic answer but man, the implications there are vast. And it requires us to go much deeper, believe it or not, than just me giving you five tips of how to fix whatever problem. Because when you deal with not just principles and practices, but a person, he is going to do much deeper work than just kind of fixing the surface level issues that you have. Maybe the conversations with a husband just to get an example out here, is with a husband who's not getting along with his wife and they've started seeking divorce. And another side note, maybe I'm, pray for the marriages in our community. I don't know, this is personal to, to Mount Air. It is, a, it is a mess out there. People jumping ship on their marriages left and right. It is heartbreaking. And I wanna encourage you to be praying for marriages in this community. And if you have friends that you know are struggling in their marriages, encourage them to fight for the covenant of marriage. It is being destroyed. And I know it's, I know it's globally, I know it's nationwide, but it's, it's heartbreaking to see it here, the abandonment of the covenant of marriage. And I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not coming down. I know that we have biblical reasons for it, but many times it is jump ship for not 
righteous reasons. And I want to just encourage you, be praying for the marriages of our community. But so say that's going on, and that's why this is on my mind. The husband comes in, sits down, and says, you know, um, there's a real problem in my marriage. And you know what he wants in that moment? He wants me to give him three or four easy things to do. Wash the dishes. (laughs) You know, suddenly... Pick up your dirty laundry. Uh, you know, say please and thank you. He wants, he wants just four or five simple things. Listen, you know, just don't talk so much. Listen more. Which actually is all fine advice. Like I'm not against, I'm not trying to say <laughs> husbands don't pick up your socks or wash the dishes. That's not what I'm saying. But that's what they want. That's principles. That's practices. That's, that's promoting certain just rules. We don't proclaim those things. We say we proclaim Jesus, which means the answer to this is far deeper than just principles and practices. Far more rewarding, but far deeper. We all want this simple, easy fix. But when you tell this person, and I've had this happen, you tell this person, I'm sorry, there's no easy fix to this. You need to get Jesus involved in your marriage at a very deep level, fixing you, working on your wife, working in the marriage, and it's going to be deep, hard work that will be eternally rewarding. And I can't tell you how many times that it comes across just, that's, I I actually was just looking for two or three things to do to make this better, And, and, and not this complexity of a person who actually can change things and make them eternally better, but it is deeper. Why is it harder? Jesus is going to convict both people of the sins that they are committing that are destroying the relationship. Jesus is going to call them, call you to humble yourself and confess your sins. Jesus is going to ask you to forgive others. He's going to ask you to walk in forgiveness even when you've been wronged over certain things. He's going to ask for forgiveness. Jesus is going to say that you should not put yourself first. He's going, to, he's going to say to husbands, they ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church, giving himself for her, laying down his life in love and service for his bride. The answer is very simple. Him we proclaim. And it is far deeper and yet more meaningful then we would really think we, we even could go. Maybe it's the individual who's got an identity crisis. They're struggling to find out who they are and, and what they want. They want help. You know, they, they, how, how can we help? I, I've got all these issues going on in my life. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. I've got these things going on. What's our answer? Not programs, not principles, not practices, not performances, things for you to do to make this better. But a person... Jesus Christ. And how can that help? He admonishes. He teaches. He warns them to not seek a life that is lived centered around themselves, their desires, their wishes, their identity, as though they are the center of the universe. To live with yourself as the center of the universe is sin. Jesus, the simple answer, is going to call for repentance. He's going to lead them down a road of taking up their cross and following him, dying to self and living for him. So all of those things are happening with the simple answer, him we proclaim. But the reality that we have to end on is this. Though though this Jesus that we proclaim does lead us down harder roads than we maybe would choose. Just give me four tips. Though dealing with the person of the Son of God incarnate is a harder road to go down than we would maybe choose at first glance, He leads us to an incredible future hope. Not only is He the answer to difficult problems you face, He's also the hope that you have in the face of very scary and difficult circumstances. When you're struggling with a diagnosis, when you're struggling with the death of a loved one, with the destruction of a relationship, or maybe you're just struggling with the weighty reality of the passage of time and the destruction of our bodies. Doesn't that get concerning at times? Man, you know, that, you know, you you go, you go golf, like 18 holes of golf and you're sore and you think, how did this, I used to be 20 and whatever and now I'm sore from doing what I could do, you know, times over and over again. And just the breakdown of our bodies. 
What do we do? What's the answer for all of this worry, all of this, this reality, this deterioration of our bodies? Well, the answer is simply, Him we proclaim. Him we proclaim. This supreme Christ who convicts and leads His people down the Calvary road, He has made sure that the road ends up with those who have traveled it standing before the judge of the universe fully justified and secured. He doesn't just give us principles to live by while we go or a plan that we should try and follow as we go along. He is the living Christ, a real person. God is the real God, eternally existing in a trinity that goes with us. It is Christ in you that comforts and strengthens you and guides you so that you will stay the course and find yourself at the end of it all at home with Jesus, filled with the joy of his presence. We proclaim Christ because this is what he came to secure for his people. Christmas Day, we celebrate God made man, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus enters the world, lives the righteous life we should have lived, fulfills all righteousness, dies the death that sinners deserve on the cross so that every one of us in this room this morning, turning from our sins, confessing it as sin, looking to Christ and His righteousness, trusting in His work on the cross, His resurrection from the dead would be forgiven of that sin and made righteous in God's sight. Earlier in Colossians, we'd be found holy, blameless, above reproach before the creator of the universe. That is what he has secured for us. So why do we proclaim him through all these difficulties, through all these ups and downs, and as hard as it is to follow Christ through difficult and tough times, relational issues, just hardness, hard hardships, as hard as it is, the rewards, the, the, the benefit of being found blameless before your Creator for all of eternity, to know ceaseless days of joy with Him, all, all of this for that future reality. One day we will stand before the throne of God and not weep and cower in fear, which is what we deserve before a righteous and holy judge. Not weep and cower in fear, but rejoice. One day we will stand before the throne and sing. Not because we've kept the performances, principles, and practices, but because of a person who has given his life that we might be forgiven, made righteous in his sight, adopted into his family forever. So for that reason, him, we proclaim. That's why every morning we celebrate communion. And we want to be intentional in remembering Jesus, who he is, and all that he has done. Let's pray. Father, we desire to just placard Jesus. <laughs> Tired of looking to self tired of looking to methods and practices, tired of looking to personal performances. Help us in this place this morning to turn from those things which dishonor you and look to Christ. Trusting him, trusting his work, rejoicing in him, staking our hope and our confidence, anchoring ourselves in the future hope Christ is ours. You are ours. We will be with you forever. May that be our eternal grounding and hope. And may that truth, that hope, that joy forever be our proclamation. Christ and all that he has done. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.